Go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, a couple of preliminary items. Uh, first, thanks to the staff of the Regents' Office and everybody else involved, the union, in helping us set up what is probably the most unusual setting for a Regents' meeting in the history of the University of Oklahoma. Um, it's a little awkward for all of us, uh, so we will all be tolerant of technical glitches and we'll do our best to get through this. Uh, to the press who is here today, thank you for attending. It's important that the public um, have access to what we're doing. Frank, can you hear us and see I us? Great. Okay, we're going to have to turn Frank's volume up. Frank, could you do a test one, two, three for us? Oh, I'm not sure I can count that high, but how about three, two, one? one two, okay, three, four, we, we, we've got the right volume. So as the first order of business, I would like to welcome our two newest regents that were confirmed by the Senate this week, Anita Holloway and Mike Colley. Welcome to the team. You've been active and involved for some time, but you're the real deal now, and you've come at a perfect time. Um, any business before we get started with uh, President Rice or Roger State? Okay. Uh, for the benefit of the press, we're going to do these meetings a little bit different than we've uh, had them in the past. We're going to try to do a little less motion practice and a little bit more substance or considerably more substance. Uh, we will have an opportunity uh, after the meetings are over for questions and answers, uh, so don't think that uh, you'll be deprived of that. But I think you'll find these reports more fulsome than in the past, and that's a good thing for you, that's a good thing for us, and that's a good thing for the Sooner Nation. So can we find Dr. Rice, or President Rice? I'm here, sir. There you are. I'm here, sir. Well, President Rice, you look thinner. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and start us with your president's report, and then we'll move into consent items, then action items. Thank you, Chairman Pearson. Can you hear me okay? Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for this opportunity to participate. It is a little little different, but uh, I will try to, to keep my remarks to the allotted uh, 20 minutes, but thank you. Uh, my opening comments, uh, and then I'll, I will certainly focus on uh, the update to, to Roger State and our summer and fall enrollment in sports and our COVID-19 response. But just some opening comments, uh, some positive news. Uh, as soon as we realize that the COVID-19 is going to be an impact, RSU Foundation stepped up and started asking donors to set up a Hillcat Heroes Fund for those students who needed assistance during this time. And so uh, we we were able to help 241 students through that private money. That was before the CARES Act. Now that the CARES Act's in place, we've set up uh, an applicant uh, procedure online and we've had 864 students to date apply for the CARES Act. But uh, we've also done some work in the community. Uh, we've uh, partnered uh, with the Career Tech on making some masks by loaning them to 3D printers. We've also uh, went into the Amish community and asked them to make to make homemade masks until the paper mask and the KN95 masks were available. We had donated our supply of N95 masks to the local hospital Hillcrest and also to a subsidiary of, of Hillcrest, which is a Utica Park clinic and their doctors. And so, so we were happy to once again, be able to buy some, some, some masks, but we, we did pr uh, provide homemade masks to those who were continuing to work. And now we've been supplying a mask to those who are are currently working at Rogers State. Uh, we do have some good news. The Oklahoma State Region for Higher Education has approved uh, an esports uh, uh, major, adding esports to our major. We've also had unmanned aircraft systems added to our major. That's going to be a real plus for us in the in the market in the, the Mid American Industrial Park in our technology. But then we had a new bachelor's in Allied Health approved uh, just uh, within the last 30 days that we will that we will market and it's heavily uh, marketable to our transferring students in 
in uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy and those that might even be seeking a nursing degree and didn't complete the nursing degree. So we believe that that will fill a niche market here in Northeast Oklahoma. We're getting ready for our first ever virtual commencement and thank you to Regent Shirley for agreeing to be our virtual speaker. She has recorded her speech and it's uploaded. I've recorded mine and that'll be on May the 16th. We do plan on having an uh, an on-ground traditional commencement at, at some point later this year yet to be determined. Continue with my opening remarks. Uh, we're very pleased to tell you that, that Roger State uh, Television has provided a very uh, pivotal and important role during this time to some of our public schools. They have partnered with Tulsa Public Schools and with Claremore Sequoia to offer uh, access for online uh, uh, over-the-air classes for 1,300 students in Tulsa Public Schools, as well as uh, Claremore Sequoia. And these are primarily third to fifth graders. And how we differ from OETA, and OETA is a great organization, but this is uh, lesson plans that the public schools have are producing, that we're producing, and, and RSU Television is airing them over the uh, over uh, Cox uh, cable, also over uh, Direct TV, as well as the the free TV, because many of our rural students do not have access to high-speed internet, so kudos to RSU TV. Uh, I will go ahead and, and, and on the agenda, I need to talk about the summer and fall semesters. So summer semester, I'm, I'm happy to report, we're up about 3% in credit hours, and we believe that has, is right in line with our request to waive the online fees. So we're very happy, uh, we, we're still pushing summer, but summer credit hours are up 3%. Uh, fall enrollment is down about 30%, and that translates to 562 actual students. And so uh, we are working that number. Uh, we have uh, 1,554 uh, applicants. We have admitted uh, 957 of those. So we've got a good market pool. We So we're working the 957 that have been admitted and not and not enrolled, and so we're calling them, we're texting them, uh, we're trying to give them as much personal attention as possible, but we believe we will close that gap, but but we are uh, prepared to, to uh, we are, we will prepare a budget that's, uh, and, and Dr. Razor's in the room with me, but but we are preparing a budget that, that will have some assumptions that we may not get there. So so that that is summer and fall enrollment, and, and I'd be happy to answer any questions at some point, Chairman. Uh, I did establish an enrollment task force uh, in previous years when we had glitches in enrollment, we had enrollment summits. So we established a, an enrollment task force that from 29 members from across the, the university family. And so we think that will make a difference. Uh, but we continue uh, the text, the phone calls, uh, we've done some postcards, we've, we've done considerable amount of, of social media. We do have a, a, a very, uh, aggressive marketing uh, campaign that that's involved in trying to close this gap for fall. One thing I believe that will close the gap for fall is we're <clears> going to to bring back, uh, welcome back uh, athlete staff on voluntary basis on May the 11th, mandatory on May the 18th, assuming there's no community spread and the community is <clears> open. <throat> but during the week of May 18th, we are scheduling a prospective students campus visits as we visit with students, the number one thing that they're just unsure of, of what they want to do this fall. They're unsure of what universities will offer. We've assured them that we will make every effort to have some traditional online classes, obviously with a mix of some on, online classes, but the week of May 18th, uh, our staff are back in the offices and we're scheduled uh, uh, our first tours uh, starting uh, on the week of May 18th. And we believe that will be a real turning point is the welcoming and we've got several students lined up prospective students that want to tour campus so we think that will be a, a serious uh, impact on uh, closing the gap on this on this fall enrollment so that summer in fall enrollment uh, the COVID-19 uh, response uh, the first thing we did is we extended spring break an extra week for our faculty to be able to prepare remote instruction and so uh, so students received two weeks of spring break. That no doubt hurt our enrollment as well. But after the second week, uh, uh, we did launch all of our, we did finish all of our classes uh, with remote instruction. 
Zoom and otherwise for the, for the spring semester. And our spring semester technically ends on May the 9th. So we're, we're there. Were our students 100% happy? No. But we've been doing some surveying. 34% of our students said that they would like Zoom to continue in the fall. 65% said they did not. But so we're trying to provide real time data through surveying our students. But, but kudos and much thanks to our faculty for stepping up and providing remote instruction for all of our students through the end of, through the end of this semester. And all of our classes for the summer will be online as well. Other COVID-19 responses. We immediately started asking students to schedule a time to move out of the dorms. We did screen. We set up a screening protocol online to screen everyone, every student before they came back from spring break. I screened every, every faculty and staff member before they came back from spring break, whether they traveled in state or not. And then we set up an orderly process for the students to start leaving on campus housing. And we were able to get almost all of them through to go home or go to alternative housing. We ended up with approximately 100 students and those students are in the process of transitioning out. And we fully intend to close our, our on campus housing with the exception of married housing on, on May the, May the 15th. We want to do a deep cleaning of, of our on campus housing. So other responses to the COVID-19, we set up a COVID-19 task force made up of my cabinet, as well as senior administrators. We, we met weekly through a phone conference. Oftentimes we would, we would ask someone from OU legal to give us guidance on our procedures. We also have guidance from OU health clinic. Our health clinic is, is a partnership and we contract with OU, OU Tulsa and they provide the, the medical doctor. And so they, so I wanted to be sure and, and give credit to OU. They've been a big help, not only on the legal side, they've been a big help on, on the medical side too, giving us guidelines in addition to the CDC guidelines, as well as we follow the state of Oklahoma's guidelines. And so we, we did transition as soon as possible, those individuals that could work from home through telecommuting. And if they could not, then we continued, they had to stay at home, but they didn't have a mission critical. There was, I think seven or eight that was sent home because they weren't mission critical. They could not commute from home. They were in some type of manual job or otherwise, but there's always been administrators and people working at the university throughout this entire experience of since spring break. And I'm very grateful for those administrators and faculty staff and groundskeepers and others that, that did continue to work and help keep the university open online. We've, we've had enrollment online. We've had a virtual tours online, trying to maintain a similar presence, but we closed the university to the public except by appointments. And if you come to the university, part of the COVID-19 protocol is you do a screening before you enter the building. And you also, we will supply you a mask to wear while you're, while you're on inside a building and while you're conducting your meeting. But we've tried to be prudent and follow CDC guidelines as well as the state health department and the governor's guidelines. But we think that, that we've been prudent in that. We think it's very safe at Rogers state. And we want to demonstrate that by bringing the staff back fully on May the 18th. We've had a considerable number of volunteer to come back in phase one on May the 11th. And we will provide a sanitation station. We will provide a paper mask. And so we believe that, and we'll provide sanitation in rooms if there is a meeting before and after the meeting. We have provided a computer access, computer labs for our students. And those have been manned by a full-time employee to make sure that students sanitize before they go in and after they, after they leave and that the machines are sanitized. And so we've tried to be vigilant about providing a very safe workspace, but we also know that it's important to bring our staff back and, and as a show of confidence to our prospective students that, that it, this is safe place. And it, it, is it still a wonderful place to work and still a place to, to learn. So the final item I was asked to, to cover is sports. A lot of, I'm sure OU knows more about this than I need to talk about, but we're still much at the, the mercy of the NCA division two. And so we're, we're, we don't recruit in the summer. We're still, you know, recruiting under the rules of NCAA and no, no visits or anything like that, no practices, but we have 
traditionally we have about 225 athletes. We now have about 248. Each coach has to help with the recruiting and enrolling, has agreed to add a few additional athletes to his or her roster. So we're very happy about that. So we're following the NCAA rules. We realized when we opened in the fall that it's still not going to be a perfect world, and we're taking steps to plan for sports, whether we have competitive sports without any fans in the stands. Same way with lodging. We realize we may have to have social distancing in our campus housing, and so we're making plans to address those issues, including classroom spaces, as we no doubt will have to have some still social distancing in the classroom environment. We're looking at options of deploying large classrooms with spacing. We're looking at blended classes where you might attend a class on campus as well as one or two hours blended. We're going to offer some traditional online classes, but we think the on-ground classes will have to have some accommodations unless some type of miracle happens between now and mid-August. So with that, Chairman, I will stop and see and yield questions. I'm not sure if I stayed within, I think I stayed within my 20 minutes of allotted time, but thank you for this opportunity. Do we have any questions from the regents? President Rice, I'd love to hear what we've learned from the online as we've shifted more online. What are the teachers saying? What are the students saying? And how does that position us for the summer and the fall? Okay, good question. We've learned that the majority of our students still do not like online classes, whether it's Zoom or that, but we're looking at a delivery method to try to accommodate those students. The survey shows that 35% of our students would like some Zoom classes to continue, whether it's Zoom in real time or Zoom that's otherwise. But so 35% of our students like Zoom and prefer to continue, 65% do not. So we want to provide some different options of both on-ground, online, and also some blended classes. We know that we have to get better training, so we're going to continue training professors and faculty members all summer. Our Center for Teaching and Learning has done a tremendous job of helping our faculty get prepared for Zoom. But our students, and remember, half of our students are non-traditional, and some of them do not have good internet connectivity in the rural areas. And so we're looking at ways to help that. We've increased some Wi-Fi hotspots in parking lots on campus, and that's one of the reasons that we've kept our computer labs open in Pryor, Barrowsville, and Claremore to those students who did not have any other option. But it has its challenges, but we know that we're better at it today than we were in the week right after spring break. But we'll continue to train faculty and try to improve the course contents for Zoom as well as the other traditional online classes. Any additional questions? I've got a question, Gary. And it's a follow-up, Dr. Rice, to Eric's question on distance learning and in the rural areas. We read in the newspaper, and I've talked to Dr. McArthur as well, what percentage of your students do not have access to internet connectivity? I would guess that it's a small percentage, and that's somewhat anecdotal. Sometimes students email me. When we first announced that we were going to finish the spring semester online, I had a few students email me and say, you know, I don't have connectivity. So I don't know the percentage, but it will be a small percentage depending upon what rural area they live in. Some rural areas have very good capabilities to their local telephone service, and others do not. It's a real gap between high-speed internet in the rural areas. It's just depending upon where you are. One option that we're looking at, Regent Cawley, is seeing how RSU television might broadcast through just the public airway some of our courses. Okay, thank you. President Rice, can I ask you to amplify that comment somewhat? It's my understanding from being out in these rural areas that 
the issue is often that the only device available to students is their is their handheld phone um, and so I see have seen students try to do spreadsheets on their phones and and read entire uh, chemistry books on their phones um, are you aware of uh, of what's being done I mean is there anything additional that's being done to to provide students with with devices that are somewhat larger than their phones uh, yes uh, uh, Regent Shirley that's a good question and we know anecdotally that that some of our students the iPhone is the only the only option they have uh, and again we've made sure that we've kept our labs open in prior Bartlesville and Claremore, even on weekends and nights, particularly in Bartlesville and prior, because the one in Claremore, you can scan in. But so that's an option. But we know anecdotally that some of our students only have iPhones. We are looking at uh, how much, what it would cost. We're surveying our students uh, to see how many of them only have an iPhone so that we might uh, consider producing or, or providing uh, an iPad or a tablet, you know, whatever the lowest cost. Uh, we're having discussions uh, in the community and, and also ways that Google might help us. But we know we don't know exactly, but that's why we're surveying our students. But we think there's there is a need for us to through technology grants to be able to provide some type of, of tablet. And we have provided some of those uh, through the Heroes Fund. Uh, we've also provided some through through the CARES Act, some of them are sort of in, inexpensive on some of some of the technology, but but we don't know exactly. But we are surveying our students to try to figure that out. Thank you very much. Any additional questions from the regions? Regent Albert, you are the uh, liaison for Rogers State. Do you have any comments that you would like to make? You know, the only thing that I might choose to add would be uh, uh, Dr. Rice and RSU have been uh, incredible partners for the Cherokee Nation as they um, use RSU TV for distance learning. Dr. Rice, you might uh, amplify on that a bit. Yes, as soon as I get unmuted. Yes, thank you, uh, Regent Albert. In addition to what we're doing with Tulsa Public Schools, uh, and the Tulsa uh, City County Library, uh, we've been uh, we've been a partnership with the Cherokee Nation for a long time. But last year, we started uh, teaching Cherokee uh, on RSU television, and, that, and again, it's on Cox Cable, it's on Direct TV, and it's on Free TV. And so you can take Cherokee, uh, the basic Cherokee language, uh, for credit or for non-credit. Well, let me back up. You can take it for uh, for just conversational uh, ability. Or if you want to go in and take a test uh, to the Cherokee Nation, you can actually go in and take and get some credit for it. But, but that's been a real uh, marketing tool for us because this is broadcast uh, uh, throughout uh, some, in some areas throughout the United States. And so we've had students, multiple students out of state that anecdotally that tell us that they're taking Cherokee online, but they have to go to uh, the, the, one of the Cherokee Nation's designated testing centers to test to be proficient in it. But, but it, it's been a real good partnership, not only with, with the Cherokees, but a real good partnership. RSU Television has been a great partner with the Mid-America Industrial Park and what we're doing in the park uh, in attracting high school students to, to the park. Thank you, Gary. Any further questions? Are we prepared to move into the consent items on our uh, iPads? Mr. Chairman, right. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, Regent Keating. Uh, I move the RSU consent agenda items number one through four be approved as listed. Thank you for the motion. Do we have discussion on any of the consent items one through four for Rogers State? Any discussion? All those in favor? You, uh, aye. Aye. It's required a voice vote for this kind of a, meeting, a virtual meeting. So I need to call their names. Oh, <laughs> okay. You mean an individual voice vote? Individual okay. voice vote. Okay. All right. 
Regent Keating, how do you vote? Aye. Mike Cawley, Regent Cawley? Aye. Regent Albert? Aye. Regent Shirley? Aye. Regent Stevenson? Aye. Regent Holloway? Aye. And you don't have to, there's not a tie. Chairman, that's... Okay, well, it's unanimous. All items on the consent agenda for Roger State pass. We'll now move into the Roger State action items, which is on everybody's iPad number five. President Rice, do you want to introduce that? Yes, sir. Uh, mandatory fee rate for summer 2020. We would we need we to have... turn the volume up a little bit. Okay. Okay. Uh, is, can you hear me? Chairman, can you hear me? Yes. Can hang on just a second, President. Can everybody in the audience here fine? Yes. Okay. All right. Please proceed. Thank you. We're asking uh, the OU board to bless uh, our efforts to not charge an online fee for the for the summer. Uh, we believe that is strategic in continuing to increase our summer enrollment. Our students were forced into this. Uh, it, we've also asked the Oklahoma State Regents uh, for higher education to waive this fee as well. Any questions? Do I have a motion? So moved. So do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Well, we're going to have to do it one by one each time. Regent Keating? Yes. Regent Cawley? Aye. Regent Albert? Yes. Regent Shirley? Aye. Regent Stevenson? Aye. Regent Holloway? Aye. All right. It's unanimous. It passes unanimously. We'll go to agenda item number six. President Rice, would you introduce that, please? Yes, sir, Chairman. Uh, we're asking the board to once again, uh, as a last resort, to approve this financial response plan should we need to invoke it. Uh, we did this uh, two and a half to three years ago. It's the same plan that was developed with uh, legal counsel uh, through the OU board. But this is kind of the, the last resort. If, if the enrollment does not materialize and we have to invoke uh, some serious, uh, very serious uh, action to, to keep our budget balanced, to balance our budget, to keep our university whole. Uh, we've had meetings with uh, uh, the faculty senate leadership, and we would also uh, have had meetings with the budget advisory council. But this is just another tool as a last resort that we would one of the major things we do is we take an unpaid furlough day, uh, one day a month, and that saves about $720,000. And again, it's a last resort. Uh, if enrollment is good, we will not need to invoke this. But if enrollment uh, does not uh, materialize, then we may have to invoke this. But, but it requires 30-day notice, and so that's one of the reasons that uh, we wanted to go ahead and, and seek board approval as, as this is an, an action item. As a, as a last resort. Do I have any questions? Do we have any questions of President Rice before I entertain a motion? Do I have a motion? Move approval. So that, do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? Chris? Regent Keating? Yes. Regent Cawley? Aye. Regent Albert? Yes. Regent Shirley? Aye. Regent Stevenson? Aye. Regent Holloway? Aye. Uh, it passes unanimously. That takes us to whether we need an executive session for anything associated with Rogers State. Regent Albert, I would ask for your opinion first. We do not. Does anybody see the need for an executive session? President Rice, do you need an executive session for any purpose, allowed purpose? No, sir. All right. Well, thank you for your report. I'll add a uh, chairman's prerogative 
comment, and this applies to all three presidents. It's hard enough to run a university when times are normal, the hours are long, the commitment is uh, complete, uh, there's a lot of moving parts at all times. Uh, with all that the world is going through right now, it is exponentially more difficult. It's groundbreaking, it's challenging, it's rewarding and disappointing, and all the above. Uh, so we really appreciate the sacrifices you and your family have made to keep things moving as smoothly as they have at Rogers State. Thank you, Chairman, and I would echo that to the Board of Regents. Thank you for your service. Uh, you've been accessible. Thank you to liaison uh, Regent Albert. Uh, thank you for your guidance. Uh, Regent Shirley, thank you. But we appreciate the Board uh, guidance, your accessibility during these difficult times for the emergency uh, declarations from time to time, Chairman, that you, that you have that you have graciously allowed us to move forward. So we appreciate the board, and I appreciate uh, uh, the ha having the opportunity to guide Roger State through this time. No doubt we will all remember this time, and hopefully it'll be over one day soon. Agreed. Thank you, President Rice. Are we ready to move to Cameron? And do we have President MacArthur available? I'm on the line, Chairman Pearson. Let's do a sound check. President MacArthur? One, two, three. Okay. Well, so far you win the, the beautiful backdrop award. Although it's a tie, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tight race. Well, thank you. It's a, it, was, it was easier than cleaning my office um, uh, to do that. Uh, I want to extend my congratulations as well to Regents Colley and, and Holloway. Uh, Regent Colley, I want to say a personal thank you to you for your generosity of time as Cameron Liaison. I look forward to our telephone calls and I appreciate your well-prepared questions each time. Uh, we're about a week ahead of uh, Rogers State University. Uh, our semester ended May 1st, so we've had the opportunity to uh, celebrate our students virtually. About two thirds of our graduates chose to participate in our virtual commencement last Friday. Uh, we are gonna do a regularly scheduled commencement and it is safe to do so, uh, but I really appreciate our faculty in journalism and media production uh, for doing that in their spare time, not that any of us seem to have any spare time uh, during these times. <clears throat> for my report, the. Combined substance can be very similar to President Rice. I'm gonna organize it a little bit differently uh, to move through. I'd like to give you a, a recap of our spring. Talk about what we're gonna do during May when the university is closed and we're not teaching classes. Talk about our summer term plans and then our fall term plans, including our FY21 budget projections. Uh, for the spring term, uh, we have no known cases of COVID-19 uh, among faculty, staff, or currently active students. I, I do regret to report uh, a recent student death, but that was due to complications uh, associated with cancer. Uh, to do that, we've been very fortunate uh, given what's going on around our country and around our state. Academically, the transition to Zoom and online went quite well for six weeks. I, it, it certainly wasn't perfect, moving over 500 courses and 3,000 students into a um, virtual environment. Uh, it, it worked, uh, but again, there were some learning pains and improvements made along the way. We're about halfway through the student election process for alternative grading. You know, so they can see their letter grade that they earned, uh, but we did because we forced them to move into a different learning environment. We gave them the opportunity to shift their grading to SU, so satisfactory, unsatisfactory, if they chose to do so. Uh, because that is such a new item, we are making individual calls to students if we think their election is not in our perception of their best interest. Okay, I know that's subjective. Financially, our total out-of-pocket expenses through April 30th is about $650,000. That in, associated with COVID-19, that includes $360,000 in student refunds for services we were not able to provide 
uh, that includes housing and meal plan refunds. The balance is cost associated with the purchase of additional computer servers, cameras, computers, uh, Chromebooks. In some cases, we distributed to students who didn't have resources. And that also includes refunds for event-based rentals. Uh, that number does not include costs associated with lost employee productivity and lost prospective student enrollment for summer and fall. Uh, we're continuing to track those and segregate those costs uh, in case there is a future reimbursement uh, opportunity. Uh, federal support through the CARES Act has, has been rapid and, uh, in my opinion, generous. I, we're pleased to have every dollar of it. Student awards of $1.74 million, uh, and that goes in the form of a $650 payment per full-time student and $325 per part-time students to eligible students. Uh, we are holding a small reserve from that $1.74 million for applications from students who had need well above uh, the other student population. We have received access to the other half of the federal funds, another 1.74 million that Cameron can use for operations, primarily with the association to the shift to online learning. Uh, we're gonna try to hold as much of that for FY21 uh, rather than using using it to shore up FY20, uh, just because we think next year's budget is gonna be tighter than this one. Um, for May, uh, again, our students and our faculty are out at this point, so we want to use time to uh, get our campus ready for a return. Uh, right now, all Camp Cameron University buildings and facilities remain closed with the following exceptions. Uh, we are keeping a portion of CU Duncan, the student center open to provide financial services and enrollment for students, and on the Lawton campus, our student union for financial services in the bookstore is open, and the Shepherd Center is open for financial aid and enrollment services. We are continuing to host the Lawton Farmers Market in our animal science facility so that we can provide access to food. I mean, that is a, a food stamp or SNAP program site, so we wanted to make sure that was open. Uh, employees for May, we do have some continuing with 100% telework. Most have returned to campus for staggered shifts and they're staggering either by time of day or by day of week. Uh, but uh, we, we, again, work to have 100% telework and have it function, uh, but it's, uh, we're having much more success with employees in the office uh, quarter time or half time during the week. I think we're seeing things move uh, much more rapidly. We have had very little use of the FMLA uh, provisions in leave. We do see some primarily associated uh, with child independent care. Um, student life and housing for May, we have 19 students remaining on campus. Those are primarily international students who are not permitted to return home. Uh, we have moved all of those students into our apartments. We have vacated the dorms and they will remain empty uh, through the summer term. Our two major uh, review teams, uh, uh, among others, but we've got two. Uh, one team is working on facilities uh, to look at signage, scheduling, room capacity, furniture arrangements, traffic flow, uh, entry and exits to buildings, stairwells and elevator usage uh, so that we can be ready for summer. A separate recommendation within that for fall and then they're looking at long-term recommendations as well. Uh, another group, another team is doing the same action but not based on facilities they're doing it based on processes you know so what are the workflow items that we do at the institution how should those be modified this summer next fall and then long term uh, chairman pearson we're, you know, we're looking at this as an opportunity to eliminate or streamline uh some of our well um, in my opinion burdensome uh processes to get rid of the cameron tour for paperwork so we can move more quickly our operational plans for summer at this point, we are gonna maintain uh, campus access restrictions. We're only gonna open 10 buildings to students and the public. Uh, we are gonna close four buildings entirely, not only to the public, but to employees as well, so that we can do some repair work uh, and um, save on some utilities there. The remainder of the buildings are gonna be open to employees, but closed to the public. We wanna be able to provide the full array of enrollment services 
and instructional services for those remaining face-to-face -face classes I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but for the most part, we're really trying to tighten our footprint during June and July. Um, uh, we have made the decision not to host any residential summer camps. Uh, it is still undecided at this time up if we will try to host any day camps uh, for children. If we do, it will probably be in the July time frame, but we're really waiting for additional guidance from the Comanche County Health Department and others. Uh, for our employees during the summer term, uh, we will continue with the staggered shifts. Uh, we will have a few faculty back, uh, and that will primarily be in our laboratory sciences. Uh, we're going to do staggered labs with um, low capacity in the classrooms. Just as a numerical example, if we had a normal class lab section of 20, they will be in four teams of five uh, and have access to the labs for 30 minutes for data acquisition, and then they'll move to other locations uh, for data analysis and report writing so that we can preserve social distancing and still give them that hands-on experience that we, we think makes the Cameron Science Education uh, special. We are also going to provide limited access to art instructional spaces for those students as well, but the remaining 90 plus percent of our instruction this summer will be virtual, primarily online, some Zoom-enabled classes. Uh, we are rolling out a uh, orientation enrollment programs. There are uh, virtual tours with computer or telephone mediated live chats with admissions counselors. Uh, we will continue to use our campus hotline that was initiated for the coronavirus Q&A and for students to schedule computer lab access. We just, Shirley, to your question about how they're getting computers, that's been our primary tool is if they don't have access at home that they can call and schedule uh, computer time uh, in a safe and clean environment. Um, that summer, uh, fall, uh, there should be two plans of operation. The one optimistic that, that we're more open, we have to be responsive to social distancing. And then the second plan, which looks a lot more like the end of the spring semester, where it's almost entirely virtual. So we have both under preparation. Uh, for the optimistic plan for student life and housing, uh, we are gonna make some modifications in the dormitory, so we'll only have one occupant per room instead of roommates. Uh, and those, uh, we are gonna limit visitor access to dormitory floors, uh, and we are gonna keep two of our apartment buildings closed, or I guess held in reserve in case we have a student quarantine space needed during the fall term. So we are making those plans. For our employees, uh, we don't anticipate a large number of employees remaining on 100% telework unless they're in at-risk populations. Uh, we will continue the staggered shifts for many staff positions. Uh, and then we're, I, again, I don't have a good read on how much of the FMLA usage we will need for child care support. I think a lot of that for us is going to depend on how K-12 uh, responds, when they open and how they open. Um, Academically, we will see more online offerings uh, than in previous fall terms, uh, but we intend to have a, a addition of synchronous online sections, I guess live online or Zoom sessions, if you like. Face-to-face uh, -face classes will be moved into much larger spaces. So I, for me, a classroom that seats 100 may have a class of 25 in there now so that we can maintain distancing uh, and then clean between sections. We will continue uh, a refined version based on lessons learned over the summer for the staggered laboratory sections. For our athletics programs, we will follow, continue to follow NCAA Division II guidance. For the Lone Star Conference, uh, in which Cameron University participates, uh, the presidents of that conference, we're considering recommendations to shorten the seasons and eliminate non-conference competition. So we reduce travel and shorten the seasons while still allowing the athletes to have a competitive experience. Our roster of fall sports include volleyball, golf, tennis, and cross country. And again, basketball will start late in the fall term. Uh, but uh, 
golf, tennis, and cross country. I think those have some fairly obvious social distancing opportunities. Uh, the volleyball being the one indoor sport there, we'll have, we'll have some work to do to make sure that our gym uh, is safe, not only for our student athletes, but for our visitors in attendance, if that's permitted, that hasn't been discussed uh, or decided yet. For budget and planning purposes for the Regents at this time, we are not planning to request an increase in total tuition and mandatory fees for next year. We are looking at the consequences and advantages of converting a portion of some of our fees into tuition. All right, so again, the, the total cost of the student would not change, but we're looking at shifting our balance of fees. Um, the scenarios that we're working, uh, uh, again, the state allocation, uh, the House and the Senate have passed. It's on the governor's desk, but you know we think that 4% number uh, reduction that they're looking at, we're using that as part of our planning scenario for the state allocation. Uh, we have the federal resources. Again, I already mentioned the CARES Act funding of 1.7 million built into the budget. And then we're looking at enrollment scenarios of down 10% and down 20%. Uh, we're certainly hoping that 10% is the more likely and, better and more hopefully that's going to be sufficient uh, taken together that's a net reduction that we have to be able to balance of five and a half percent and then for the more pessimistic scenario uh, eight and a half percent reduction so those are the scenarios we're working through on our budget creation uh, that we'll present to you at the at the june meeting um, subject to your questions any questions from the regents? Yeah, Gary, I have, a, I have a question on the online fees. John, do you have any intention of adjusting or waiving any of those fees, or do you think your specific fee uh, is appropriate at this time? I think it's, a, it's, it's certainly been a subject of debate with the vice president, uh, Regent Keating. Our online fee is $50 a, a credit hour, so it's, it's a little bit less uh, than our sister school in, in Claremore. Uh, our expenses uh, are, are significant in that area. So, they, so we're taking the position right now for summer uh, that since the student has the choice to enroll or not, uh, and they know the cost going in, we have elected to continue to charge that, that fee. We are considering uh, refunding some of the other fees uh, um, if we are not able to provide those services, such as activity fees, facility fees. So rather than waiving the academic services fee, the distance learning fee you mentioned, we're looking at, at refunding some of the mandatory fees. Uh, so the net uh, effect to the student will be that they're paying less, but we're gonna handle it a little bit different way. Uh, okay. For the fall term, uh, we do intend to charge the fees. Uh, uh, we also have the opportunity to present a budget to you in June with a request for tuition and mandatory fees. So if we want to make an adjustment, uh, my preference would be rather than to request permission from you to waive something, I would rather bring a budget forward to you or you can approve it and that be the standing rate. Very well, thanks. Any further questions? Regent Colley, you're the designated liais liaison for Cameron University. Do you have any comments? Uh, just a couple, Gary. Uh, I've enjoyed my interaction with Dr. MacArthur, uh, and I would say it's been uh, very refreshing for me um, in this world that's been turned upside down, and particularly in higher education, to see the enthusiasm and vigor with, with which John is carrying out his function. I see it in Dr. Rice and his presentation today, and I see it all the time with Joe Harris as well. So I kudos to you guys for hanging in there in difficult times. Uh, Gary, I reviewed all of these matters with Dr. MacArthur. Uh, in addition, he took some time to go through the status of their strategic plan. He gave a shout out to Regent Stevenson for his assistance in developing some of the pillars of that planning, and I thought that was uh, very interesting and very helpful. And uh, so it, uh, from my standpoint, things look well at Cameron. President MacArthur, were you able to hear my comments on behalf of the Board of Regents earlier that were made at the conclusion or the remarks of President Rice? 
I, I, I did, and then on behalf of, well, of me and, and my spouse, thank you for your comments and, and recognition. But I also want to echo, recognize and echo uh, President Rice's thanks to the board. I mean, to you in particular for helping me keep a great vice president on for another year. Thank you for responding to that so quickly. Regent Colley, again, you've been available anytime I've had a question. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move to the consent action items. There appear to be four. I would move the approval of those four items. Do I have a second? Any discussion? Any questions? All right. Regent Keedy. Your vote, Regent Keedy. Your vote. Sir, I muted. Aye. Regent Collin. Aye. Regent Albert. Yes. Regent Shirley. Aye. Regent Stevenson. Aye. Regent Holloway. Aye. Chairman, unanimous vote. Okay, thank you. We'll now move to the Cameron University action items or item. Since there's only one, it's number five on your agenda on your iPad. President MacArthur, would you explain this, please? I think this is just an opportunity for an executive session. Oh, it, it is. Not. I'm sorry, I had to take my glasses off. Uh, do you see any need for an executive session? I, you, you've allowed me to express all my concerns in the public portion. Thank you. Okay. Regent Colley, do you see any need for an executive no, session? Do any of the regents see the need for an executive session? All right. Uh, President MacArthur, we appreciate your time and effort. And, and by the way, the nice comments extend to all of your staff. Thank you so and much. And faculty. Thanks, John. Okay, that moves us to the University of Oklahoma, beginning with the President's report. Um, for the benefit of anybody that didn't hear earlier, this report is going to be more fulsome than in the past. Uh, it's been approved, uh, reviewed and approved to take some time. So if anybody would like a break before Interim President Harris starts, now would be a perfect time. Otherwise, we'll proceed ahead, but we're looking at 45 minutes plus or minus. Does anybody need a break or want a break? Stretch your legs. We good to go? Interim President, please Thank you, begin. Mr. Chair. It did sound ominous the way you introduced the uh, length of the time and the need for a break. Yes, I hope the chairman was an error <laughs> in that analysis. <laughs> You're new here. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, thought I might begin by, first of all, saying thank you. Uh, obviously, there's a great deal to cover in and around COVID uh, and the status of where things are and where they're going. But I thought before we launch into that, uh, that it would be great to talk about a, a very bright spot and a great example of uh, who our professors are and what we do. And the example came and we saw it in the New York Times and across um, all publications over the last couple of days. As we know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Facebook, that includes uh, other large enterprises, including Instagram, has been trying to assemble what it, he has called a Supreme Court uh, to pass judgment on uh, speech content that are on those social media platforms. And over the last 18 months, they've endeavored to do this. Uh, they've had over 2,000 uh, experts provide their input from 88 countries. The initial grouping of 20 people on that quote, uh, court uh, that may go to 40 people. The initial 20 were announced two days ago, and one of those is one of our professors, uh, the International Law Chair in the College of Law, Profession uh, Professor Evelyn Aswad. And it is a huge undertaking that she has, a huge credit to her in that initial grouping of 20, which I would, I would recommend you to look at those 20. It includes former prime ministers. Uh, it includes Nobel laureates. Uh, and it includes Evelyn Aswad uh, here at the University of Oklahoma uh, to engage in that task. So a great deal of pride. Uh, she brings that to the classroom. 
Uh, I was honored to be a part of recruiting her as a team uh, when she had spent 14 years at the U.S. State Department uh, focusing on international and human rights issues and uh, very proud of her. She brings so much to the classroom, so much to the research she does, and now so much in her service to society uh, in this important role. Um, and she's also a terrific person. If you don't get a chance, if you get a chance, you ought to meet her. She's, uh, she's a stunning example of who we are. As we turn to COVID-19, it is, I think it escapes none of us, for those of us that are in this room, when you look around the ballroom that ordinarily at this exact time uh, would have housed uh, about 350 to 400 people as we all sat on the Friday of graduation and um, heard speeches from our honorary degree recipients. That's where so many of us have been for so many years, and now there are about 20 of us occupying this room. And so uh, there is so much that is different right now. We know it is temporary. We just don't know how long temporary is, uh, but it's profoundly different. Um, and I'm so proud of the way that we've adopted and adapted, but uh, let's be honest, it's all imperfect. Uh, it, is, uh, it is different, uh, and we are getting through it. And when we talk about resilience, uh, I think there's a great measure of that, and that is ordinarily this evening we'd be gathering, you know, de weather dependent, hopefully um, in the stadium for graduation. Sometimes it goes to Lloyd Noble, but ordinarily there. Um, and customarily, we have about 3,500 graduates that show up in person for our graduation. And while we're going to have an in-person event in August, uh, we, we, we couldn't miss celebrating this moment right now, and so we decided to have the virtual graduation like so many schools. There was a great idea from our events team, and they're spectacular. Uh, there's a box here we can show you, but the idea was to send each graduate a box. Each graduate that promised they'd listen to all of graduation online, to send them a box that in includes celebratory materials, um, streamers and the like, uh, glow sticks and, and those sorts of things to celebrate their graduation. And they put together a graduation that you'll see tonight that allows their name to be up there, their image to be up there so they can celebrate with their families. And what is stunning is that 3,500 students is the typical number that arrive in the stadium for graduation. And right now we just crested 4,000 students who have requested that box uh, and who'll be watching it tonight along with their families. So. Uh, it's imperfect, but it is also a sign of our resilience and who we are um, as the Sooner Nation. And uh, it'll also be broadcast thanks to Regent Albert on, on Cox, uh, Roger Ramsire and, uh, uh, and Mr. Kirk, Percy Kirk, are the ones at Cox that are also uh, putting this not just over um, uh, the link we have, but also over Cox. So we appreciate that. It's a good sign of our resilience and where we are. There's been a lot of anxiety over the last several weeks. The last time this board met, um, we were fully in session. It was just that afternoon of the last day of the meeting that we called off the Big 12 basketball tournament, and then succession of events took place. Um, what is stunning is obviously all of our classes went online. We did not miss a day of classes by moving online. But I do think, and, and obviously our campus looks very different right now, but what, is, what deserves quick recognition uh, quick only in terms of time, but not in terms of the depth of our gratitude, are the people that never went home. And it's all of our health care workers that never went home during any of this. It's our plumbers, our electricians, our heat and air folks, our carpenters, our police, and so many more. And we're going to talk about how we're phasing our return, but we should recognize the service that they provided for us uh, to help us through this. And we're certainly grateful for that. All right, let's talk about higher education in the broadest context of COVID. What does it mean? And a recurring theme through this will be how much we have a number of data points, but the reality is how much we still don't know. And so what are those data points that are out there right now? Now, there are big data points we've all looked at, and all of these will tie then to where the University of Oklahoma is going. When you look at big data points out there, if you looked at the headlines today, you saw 14.7% unemployment across the country the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression. Of course, behind those numbers is the reality that three-fourths of those jobs right, are, are almost certainly variable with the length of the pandemic. But it's still a startling and stunning number. Goldman Sachs came out a couple of days ago showing that second quarter U.S. GDP uh, is projected by them to be down 34 percent. 
So these are numbers where nobody um, can avoid what's taking place. Uh, But it also has to be put in context and understood how variable they are. As we look at these, higher education is fascinating. A prediction made by a credible source before the pandemic was upon us was that higher education had some systemic changes. It was being disrupted like any area. Prior to the pandemic, uh, uh, one prominent scholar noted that among the 1,000 or so liberal arts, private liberal arts colleges in the country, that within five years, 100 would be gone. And that author revised that just recently to 200 or 20 percent in the next year. So there are material and, and catalyzing impacts for what is taking place right now. Going into this crisis, going into this pandemic, 30% of the universities in the country were running operating deficits. 60% had missed their targets for number of students coming in. So coming into this crisis, there was already structural instability. We've had lots of discussion, particularly with this board, about the ramping up of debt and other amenities that have attached as well. So this is the backdrop. And it is, it is not as though any university is immune from this. Princeton University, with a $23 billion endowment, immediately put in place a hiring freeze, salary freezes, and other austerity measures. So nobody is immune from this. And obviously, those large areas that make up institutions from athletic re- tuition, athletic revenue, state budget cuts for the public institution and housing um, are all at issue. And the prediction is, across the board, some 15% decrease um, in students overall. All right, so um, we've seen across the country hiring freezes, capital project halts, layoffs, furloughs. And then we've seen distinct and unique challenges about which we have to be aware that attach not just to higher education, but uniquely to academic medical institutions and, quite frankly, healthcare generally. Uh, since the pandemic, even though in, in the preparation, especially for um, a surge, people are not going in for elective procedures. In some cases, many enterprises are not taking elective procedures. OU Medicine is reopening shortly with those, but that's resulted in 30 to 40 percent and sometimes greater declines in patient volumes in those enterprises. And just as a good example, before we get to OU specific, we might look at uh, the gold standard Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins. Uh, was looking at this year just 30, 45 days ago with running a $72 million surplus for this fiscal year, ending June 30. They're now projecting down $100 million. When they're looking at FY22, this next fiscal year, starting July 1, they're projecting a $375 million loss. So, so no one is exempt from this, and everyone is impacted. And so how are, we, how are we sizing this? How are we approaching this? Uh, what is our plan here at the university? So as we look at this, let's talk about FY21 and then move to FY21. FY20, of course, ends at the end of June and became directly impacted around spring break. Um, what are those expenses? Let's start with Norman Campus. What are those expenses that we saw mount? Uh, we were among the first to refund student tuition uh, and food. Uh, that was a $7.4, $7.5 million expense right out of the box. Um, we had one, one conference, the Encore conference, could not take place, a $2 million loss. Um, you can go through the li- of course, all the extra cleaning has taken place in preparation across the board. We took actions to offset these, uh, capital project deferral, discretionary spending freezes. Um, we had student worker furloughs. Uh, we had position hiring freezes. Net of all of this, uh, and this is still variable, but we're around a negative 4 million, uh, 4, 4.2 million is our best estimate right now, Norman Campus for FY, um, for FY20. When we look at uh, the Health Sciences Center, uh, loss of patient revenue, um, consistent with the rest of the country, uh, both academic hospitals and, and for-profit, not-for-profits that are not academic. Um, uh, similar issues, patient service revenues are the largest. Uh, we've taken steps in those areas as well. Um, this can be covered, and we have plans to cover it, but roughly a $10 million, $10.5 million uh, hit in uh, this fiscal year. Now, there's CARES Act money to help with this. Uh, as you know, there's about uh, about half a million went to the Health Sciences Center, Norman Campus, 
Um, there's 18 million, nine of that goes directly to students, and nine is available to help offset some costs. So it helps without a doubt, um, but certainly um, is not sufficient. Um, good news, we moved aggressively on summer enrollment. Our summer enrollment this year, which is exclusively online, we moved all summer online. We also uh, eliminated all camps and clinics on campus. That's about six to 7,000 students that would have been here this summer in those camps and clinics. And we eliminated the in-person uh, education. The great news is, um, which was, was uh, encouraging, is that our summer enrollment online is up 20%, which is a material number. Uh, we've taken immediate action, as I indicated. We implemented hiring freeze, and I've, I've walked through those. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we size and address the problem for the coming fiscal year? And sizing this problem is difficult because there are so many variables that attach to it. So everything is said with complete qualification. The first thing you do, though, um, is you communicate. And one of the things we've been doing is communicating with this board. Um, we have had literally weekly phone calls with key groups that we have to be speaking with. And I don't want to go through a litany of all of them, but I do want to mention some folks we're, we're meeting with regularly to discuss the size of the problem in very honest terms and with the list of options we have to address it depending upon the size and scale. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Norman Faculty Senate, Chair Joshua Nelson, incoming Chair Amy Bradshaw, um, in detail conversations, regular basis. Norman Campus Staff Senate, Sarah Connolly, Health Science Center, Faculty Senate President Catherine O'Neill, Staff Senate at the Health Science Center Kelly Dyer, Kristen Rodriguez, Staff Senate. Our students have been remarkable. You all know our student uh, SGA President Justin Norris. He's been a huge help, uh, Crystal Wynn um, and Elisa Douglas. Um, they've been terrific to meet with, to sit down and talk about what they see, what we see, and how we can work through it together. They're not comfortable conversations because a number of the answers involve real cuts. We've talked about furloughs and how we'd handle those. We've talked about other cuts that might be necessary. Now, sometimes folks want to pick that up and say that's exactly what you're doing. Uh, we haven't made those final decisions. What we're doing is trying to size the problem and make sure that whatever this scenario is, that we're ready for those. Um, Governor Kevin Stitt, the leadership of, uh, of the uh, legislature, our mayors, uh, have been terrific. All right, so what does this thing look like? Um, lots of planning. Uh, the first thing we uh, formed were a number of task forces. The first task force was an enrollment task force. The prediction nationwide is that enrollments will be down nationwide for colleges and universities 15 percent. That's the most credible source that's out there. It's about two weeks old, which has some age to it, but that's the number. Now, we also know there are two things that happen. It isn't just what percent down you are, but also because there will be schools that will be failing, what happens in terms of irrational pricing around that. So you have to look at total number of students, but also um, the discounting that takes place around that, which has an amplifying effect. I'm so proud. Let's we'll start with Norman Campus and then go to the Health Sciences Center. Norman Campus, um, the Jeff Bolanek, uh, who works with Kyle Harper and that team, they are true professionals. Uh, there is a, uh, we went through and asked, how are we doing relative to our peers in terms of communicating and recruiting during this crisis. Uh, there's about 10 categories of things that we're doing. We compared it to peers. The next best was something like four or five of those 10. Uh, they are reaching out in very direct and personal ways. We don't get to show our beautiful campus off in person, but they're doing a whole litany of things uh, to get this done. Right now, and this number changes, but right now uh, we are down two to 3% uh, in the number of freshman commits. That's much better than 15%. How many percent? Two to three percent is what that number. We look at that every day. Uh, now, there are a lot of variables. Everyone in this business talks about summer melt, which is do you lose students during the summer? Uh, they'll be, so I don't want to say this is a final number. It's a material number, but it's not final. Um, but they are doing a stunning job uh, working in that space. And so right now, rather than being 15% down, we're down that two to 3%. And obviously, I can add color and detail as you'd like, but I'm uh, uh, trying to be respectful of Regent Cawley's admonition about time. The, we also don't want students to stop. There is a real temptation because of 
of concerns without a doubt over money that are, that are stunningly real, about concerns of safety. One of the messages to our students is do not stop. Let us help you find a way to continue your education because we know what the statistics are around students that stop their education and pause their education no matter what the intent. The statistics show a huge attrition rate of students that do not continue their education. And so we've started funds, uh, we, we've raised money, um, we've also added money um, in material ways to help make it, our goal was that any student that says and is concerned that they cannot make it because of financial, the financial crisis around COVID, that we have a solution for them that can help them get through. We've added a million and a half since this started in additional uh, fee waivers to help students most disadvantaged by this economically. We started a fundraising campaign um, and we've also added a million and a half dollars more in uh, discounts for those students in our housing and food to help them uh, not interrupt their education to avoid the disastrous result uh, that can occur. The retention, so there's two key numbers. One is what does your freshman class look like? I've covered that two to three percent down is what that looks like right now with hopes we can bring it up. There's also what is the retention of, of your students that are upper class students? Uh, right now that number is um, trending down about five to six percent. We're working hard on that. We think we can make inroads, uh, but that's a real issue. And that is a direct effect. We poll our students, we do focus groups, we do surveys. Um, so much of that is related to concerns economically, and we're, help, we're trying to address those. So our goal is to address those, um, but they're real. As we look at it, um, and then we have planning scenarios around each one of these scenarios. We plan, we, we plan for you know, 5% down, 10% down, 20% down. 30% down. Across the board, how would, how do, what would that impact be and how do we react to those? Uh, the next uh, uh, task force that I'll cover is the instructional task force. Uh, the goal is, is to be safe and resilient. You've heard a lot of these already. I won't cover them, but certainly it includes relocate, relocating classes to larger classrooms. Uh, it includes uh, restructuring class schedules, expanding the calendar from an 8 to 5 calendar to a 7.30 a.m. to an 8 to 9 p.m. calendar, uh, requiring PPE, an acronym we're, we're, with which we're now all well familiar, um, increasing time between classes to allow for social distancing and encouraging flexible course design. There's an entire committee working on this uh, around the clock, and I can't tell you how hard these teams are working. Uh, they are working night and day. The housing committee has done terrific work. Um, we've extended flexibility for our housing. We've changed the housing mix. We're going to about 300 housing units that will be singles uh, in the towers. Uh, we've added a million and a half dollars extra for the welcome home scholarships uh, uh, that we started last year, moving those from 100 uh, to, to 400 this year. Uh, we have uh, an initiative, and there's two handouts that will keep my time down that I, I asked to be prepared yesterday. One of those is the Clean and Green Initiative, and it's an initiative that applies to our housing units and across campus, and it articulates the links that we're going to to ensure the campus is clean. It is expensive, it is worth every penny of it, um, but it is, it is a whole range, everything from electrostatic spraying to changing out all of the fixtures on the Norman campus and the bathrooms so that everything is touchless. Uh, and also looking at, at other air purifiers that exist and new kinds of filtration devices. So a great deal of work is going into that, which I think will have a material impact. You know, a question on everybody's mind is, what about athletics? Um, we do not control our destiny in athletics. We're part of a conference and a part of the NCAA. I can tell you we're working on it daily. The intent is to have, um, and the belief right now is that there will be sports in the fall. The question in what form and exactly how is a question being worked on daily for which there are not bright and clear answers at this moment. It is a serious work in progress. Uh, it is important and material, uh, working with our athletic director, working with uh, certainly because football is, uh, is the revenue sport, um, working with Lincoln Riley, uh, working with the Big 12 commissioner, obviously the NCAA, a lot of conversation going on, um, a deep desire to have it this fall, an intention to have it this fall, but there are so many specifics that go into this 
that are just now being worked through that there is not clarity over exactly how it will occur, but that's being worked on uh, in a very aggressive uh, and, and planful way. Uh, Health Sciences Center, clinical revenue is the big issue. Uh, There is the clinical revenue that attaches to OU Physicians uh, and then OU Medical Inc. Those are both down, consistent with peers in the market and peers across the country, 30, 40, in some places 50 percent. There is a move back to, um, we are now moving back to the elective health care procedures. We're already seeing some very favorable Um, uh, better than anticipated bounce back in some of the numbers around it. I don't want to paint too rosy of a picture. There are still material issues, but but we're we're monitoring that very closely. Uh, uh, Jason Sanders, uh, provost, is on Zoom with us. Uh, A lot of work going into that, a lot of detail, um, working closely with the hospital. But but clinical revenues um, are definitely and materially impacted, uh, and, uh, and we'll keep this board and certainly the public uh, abreast of that. The next question is safety, general safety, in addition to the sanitation we talked about. um, How do we come back on campus in the fall in a way that is safe? Uh, Our plan is definitely to come back this fall. One of the elements we have not discussed is how do we handle testing and tracing uh, in those elements? We've asked uh, I've asked Tomas Diaz de la Rubia, our VP for uh, research and partnerships, to work with our Health Science Center team and a team here on Norman campus. Uh, We're also working with uh, a private group here in Norman called EMI, working on, and and we're piloting how we would do testing and tracing. Uh, That launches in the next few days. We're doing a phased return on campus. Uh, The phased return for Norman campus begins May 11th. It's being done in tranches. We have a detailed plan on that. Um, I'm tempted just for Regent Colley to read all six pages of that plan out loud and uh, contra to my usual approach slowly. Um, but we have a detailed plan on how to do that and to use that as a pilot to help inform us for how we handle it when all of the students come back in the fall, uh, both in housing and otherwise. And so a lot of work uh, going into that and a lot of steps uh, that, that are attendant to it. The Health Science Center... Uh, has already begun a phased return. Obviously, the healthcare side never stopped moving forward. Uh, incredible work was done to make sure that if the surge had been as bad as anticipated in the first round, that we would have been there for our state. That came at a financial cost, but it's the right thing to do. But more so than other hospitals, we made sure we were the primary hospital for COVID. There's a cost to that. Uh, we're willing to pay for it. Um, but it is a role that we play. Uh, the return for the Health Science Center beyond the medical side has already begun. It began May 4th. Uh, it's a phased return as well with the plan uh, that comes with that. Tulsa, because it has HSC and Norman Campus employees, is following the protocols for each of those campuses as they return uh, uh, into their positions. Uh, so at a very high level, Uh, That's where we are. There's one more handout that I will not go through in detail. It's one of the two handouts that was provided. If you're joining us uh, virtually, we'd be happy to email these to you. Um, But this walks through the Health Sciences Center and the major things they've done. And I'll read the headings here. They have provided to our state public health and infectious disease expertise, new clinical trials and treatments, vaccine research for a cure, diagnostic testing and research, um, obviously frontline patient care, Uh, but they're doing remarkable things. I I will conclude, the words you're waiting for, um, I will conclude um, by saying uh, how proud I am uh, to work with everyone involved in this. Uh, They're working night and day. Uh, This board is a serious board. Uh, This board has held committee meetings. They've been available. They've provided insights from their industries. Uh, If anybody wants to know what a board does, this is an example. I would say to the frontline workers, to the folks that have telecommuted, um, to all of those that are engaging in planning and acting selflessly and lending their expertise, um, this is um, a difficult time, but it also proves that crises reveal character, uh, and I couldn't be more proud of the character of this institution. That concludes my remarks. Questions of the interim president? I see that you've run off 
Regent Shirley. I saw that too. That's kind of why I went to in conclusion. Yeah. This is not any kind of a surprise to any of the rest of us. Any questions from the regents present? Yeah, Joe, this is Frank. I've had a number of people who felt their elective surgeries were essentials for their health. You know, whether it's a leg operation or a cancer treatment, these are not tummy tucks and these are not facelifts. Is elective surgery a word of art? Did we make the decision of what we decided was elective or is that something that is basically in a textbook somewhere? Because I just have been rather surprised the number of people who have approached me about that issue. Could you answer that? I hate to take up any time for something like that. Governor Keating, that's a really important question. So let me be very clear. The definition of what is an elective surgery rests with the discretion of the physician and the physician only over what is an elective procedure. And so it rests with the physician. I will say, though, that cancer being the example, the Stevenson Cancer Center has never closed down because those procedures are not discretionary. They're not elective. And so at no point have we closed Stevenson down. But the decision about what is elective and what is not rests as a medical decision, not an administrative decision. Joe, really appreciate, as Gary said earlier, all the work and how you responded, how the leadership team has responded in general. It's been amazing to watch. And I'm grateful for it and all the regents are grateful for it and really proud of the effort and the work. One of the things you mentioned was summer online, if I heard you right, summer online enrollment is up 20 percent. What about total? What about total summer enrollment? That's all we have is summer online enrollment. We're not doing in-person enrollment on the Norman campus. I guess what I was looking at versus last year, how many people we had on campus. If you take what was on campus versus what we have online, how do those two, are we net up? Yeah. I don't have a specific answer. I'd love to get that to you and supplement it. I'd be I'd be speculating. Or put it another way, how many hours enrolled? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think the right answer would be this answer of total total credit hour production would be the number. So why don't I bring back to this board total? Maybe another way to get there is is, you know, we've talked a lot about online education and where we're headed. And just having this, you know, we have a crisis and let's make the best. What can we learn? How can we learn super fast? The mistakes that we're going to make, make them quickly adjust. But use this summer to really position us for we don't know what's going to happen in the fall or next year. But how do we use this summer to really accelerate our learning? Yeah. Excellent question. And one we've been we've been racking our brains over. And so you've accurately distilled it. There's the question of how can we make sure that if we have to go online for all classes or this next semester or next year, that we do it in a way that's that's more robust than this year. Then there's the question of how do you make sure that your online instruction itself, independent of the in person, is also made stronger. And we're working on both of those right now. And in fact, there's an overlay as we're looking at what percent of our classes that are always provided, that have historically always been provided in person, could we also make online? And our goal is to get to 10 to 20 percent of those over the course of this summer. And so it really is multi-pronged. It's how many overlay courses can be in both formats, how many of the in person, if we have to transition over, can be done in a way that is even more efficiently and better delivered. And then how do you build up your online portfolio itself? And we're trying to work all three of those at the same time. And we're seeing good progress. Part of what I've been working on is, as you know, Greg Garn is helping us in this space. Martha Bantz, who's on this agenda, is helping us with non-traditional learners. And then Kyle Harper's enterprise is working on making sure that the online that is provided in the event of additional need to go fully online is better. And let's be really clear, and that is not all online is created equally. Online that's done through instructional designers and done in a thoughtful way is very different than going into a, just simply going into a Zoom classroom. 
And so it's in that context and through those lenses that we're looking at how do we accelerate our online instructional abilities uh, in light of this crisis. And, and, and you know this, and we've talked about this, in any major crisis like this, you know, just go back. There's always winners and losers. And this is going to, you know, this is going to shift some way. We don't know how, but shift education in remarkable ways. And I just want to make sure that we're thinking about how do we make sure we're on the, the sustainable, winning, moving forward uh, side of that and not on that. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. I mean, at, at the highest level, um, at the very highest level, um, I, I went through and talked about what the, what the higher education landscape briefly looked like coming into COVID and what it looks like right now at this spot. Um, it is without a doubt catalyzing that disruptive change. And um, we have a number of, and so whenever we talk in our, our, our meetings, our leadership meetings about what are we facing, we, 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 we ask a very bulk question. And that is, is what we're going through going to be bumpy and we get through it? Or is it life-threatening? Is it, is it an existential threat for the institution? And I can tell you there are so many enterprises, so many higher education uh, institutions that fall into this existential crisis space right now that weren't there, to your point, uh, five or six weeks ago. As we look at it right now, we believe that a number of things position us well to be in the bumpy, but we're going to get through it category. Uh, and hopefully, if we do this right, not just get through it, and our touchstone for success isn't survival, it's coming through it stronger than we were before, even though we know it's going to be a rough tranche getting through the next 12 to 18 to 24 months. So how are we positioned in a way, those are easy words to say, but why do we fall in, in the camp of, of, you know, bumpy but get through it versus um, the, the, the chance to be extinguished? And as we look at it, it's a number of things. First of all, um, the Health Science Center is um, the patients will come back. Uh, that will continue to be robust. We know that, that, that professional education in economic downturns goes up, and we're seeing that. So the Health Science Center will get through this and move itself through it. Norman Campus, as you look at it, um, we're optimistic because a few things happened. We're not in that 30% of schools that was losing money the last two years. We restructured 50 million two years ago. This year, we will restructure 25 million in operating expenses. And we're also committed to making hard decisions over the course of this next year that will ensure that we are, that, that, that we are structured well. But there are still many players in higher education that even if they do those things, can't survive because their model itself won't work. And so the position we're in is highest quality at an affordable price as a public flagship. And we believe those are the three things um, that, that put us in a position that if we have the right plan and if we execute and if we operate like a, a healthy university should with great communication, a heavy level of honesty, and not being scared to make difficult choices, that for us, we should not just go through and be in the group that's bumpy but gets through it, but be in one that emerges stronger than before. So that's our, that's our belief. We're not arrogant about it. We know it's not preordained, but we believe that we are um, uh, in that right market position. Uh, does that answer your question? Thank you. Other questions or comments Joe. or concerns? Joe, how is, how is the morale of the faculty and staff, both on the Norman campus and the HSC campus? I mean, we've now been going through this night and day for for eight to ten weeks, and, and that does take a human toll. Yeah, it, it does, and uh, two, two ways of responding to that. One is objective, so we're doing a good deal of surveying on what the instruction felt like uh, from the professor's vantage, from the student's vantage, how many had taken on, you know, all of that. So there's objective data that we have that measures that. So anecdotally, I can tell you that our representative group leaders have been fabulous. And uh, they've been in intense communication with those groups. They have me on Zoom calls. They have other leaders on Zoom calls with not just the executive leadership team, but with the full faculty senate, with the full staff senate, uh, with those groups. Um, we have our leaders doing things like, you know, online after hours parties that are on Zoom to keep morale up. Um, everyone knows that it's going, that it's hard for everyone. Uh, I think morale is really good. It, it can't be excellent because it's a tough time. 
Uh, but one of the things I've learned a long time ago is that people can take almost anything as long as you communicate. And so the touchstone during all of this is to engage in communication at every turn, whether the news is good news or bad news. Right? It's uncertainty that creates uh, a level of anxiety that, that erodes morale. And so that's what we're trying to do, and it's a team effort. And so that's the goal, and I'm, I'm so proud of, of the folks that are leading those, those entities. Thank you, and you have done a very good job of, of communicating, Thanks. so thank you. Thanks. Oh, go ahead. Sometimes to excess. <laughs> yeah, but I can read it at my leisure. <laughs> I'm speaking personally. <laughs> yeah. uh, any other comments, questions, concerns, or thoughts, or suggestions? Okay. Uh, Joe, you heard my comments earlier. Um, I know from a very up close and personal uh, stance the time and the effort that you personally have been putting in, and that goes for the Regent staff and everybody else here. It's uh, inspiring, it's humbling, uh, and we're all very thankful for it. Without leadership and high quality leadership right now, this university, along with any other university, would flounder. Uh, and you've done a really great job of that. But the easy part's a heart behind us. It is. Yeah, the hard part's coming. So, it is. Uh, please have your staff, please have the faculty pace themselves. And the same for you, because we're in this for the long haul. And there's a burnout factor that uh, can take over if we're not all careful with that. Agreed and appreciated, and as you know, and everyone here knows, it's it's uh, it is everyone. Okay. All right. Um, was Ken going to make a presentation at this point, or is he? I don't he... believe so. Okay. All right. Well, why don't we move into consent agenda items, then? It appears to me that we have twelve. Consent agenda items. Is that correct, Chris? Yes. yes. Do I have a motion to approve those consent items? I move that you agenda items 1 through 11 be approved as listed. 1 through 11 or 1 through 12? I have. I have 12. Yeah, tw uh, the 12 snuck in there here more recently. <laughs> uh, do I have a second? Second. Do we have any discussion about these 12 items? If not, Chris, I'll ask you to take the roll. Regent Keating? Yes. Regent Cawley? Aye. Regent Albert? Yes. Regent Shirley? Aye. Regent Stevenson? Aye. Regent Cawley? Aye. Okay. Unanimous, General. Items 1 through 12 pass unanimously. Let's move to OU action items where we have a number. And would the interim president please lead us through beginning with item 13. Yes, sir. Agenda item 13 is a delegation of authority. Um, this is an effort to streamline the process to get approval for new programs. As Regent Stevenson indicated, uh, higher education is dynamic. Uh, the process for new program approval can take, if done correctly, 12 months. Uh, by allowing for this delegation, we believe we save two or three months. It does not remove the uh, role of the board. The relevant committee chair would give their consent. Um, uh, it would then be filed with the state regents to save time. At the next regular meeting, it would come before this board. And if the board said no, we'd pull the item, but it would at least save a couple of months. Any discussion? Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I, I do have a second. Any, any discussion now? Excuse me. Let's have a vote. Regent Keating. Yes. Regent Cawley. Aye. Regent Albert. Yes. Regent Shirley. Aye. Regent Stevenson. Aye. Regent Hallway. Aye. It's unanimous, Mr. Chairman. Item 13 passes unanimously. Let's move to item 14, President Harris. Agenda item uh, 14, this is a request um, to modify the current admissions procedure um, that has restricted 
the only test being accepted by law school, by our law school as the LSAT uh, to also allow for the inclusion of the GRE, uh, the graduate records examination. The rationale behind this is that um, it, it, is, it is influenced by COVID-19, but it is not only because of that. Over the last several years, for a number of reasons, including attracting a broader pool of candidates and a deeper pool of candidates, uh, many schools across the country have moved to this standard. Uh, with COVID, uh, a much larger number of schools are moving to it. It has many benefits. Uh, it is predictive of a student's success. Uh, it's been tested across the country and is being recommended by this board uh, for approval for the Admissions Committee of the College of Law to use this as a tool. Joe, I do have a question on this one. I apologize. I should have called, called you beforehand and talked about it. This has the appearance of making it easier to get in. Uh, it, it does. One of the concerns was, does this make it easier to get in? Uh, the goal of the LSAT was to see if the score could be predictive of a student's opportunity to succeed, ability, probability to succeed. Uh, uh, there were schools that started doing this three years ago, four years ago. A number of schools, including OU Law, decided to wait uh, and see how those schools actually did and how it influenced the profile of their classes. Give me, who else in the Big 12 uh, uses this standard? Ooh, I can get you a list of the schools you would recognize that are direct competitors. Okay. This is not a lower level school uh, uh, mechanism. This is being used across the board by, by top schools. Okay. Yeah, and we can get you that list, but it is, I think the thrust of the question is, is this something that, that schools use that are lower ranked? And the answer is no, top schools are using this as well. I, I would, I've never heard of it, yeah. so that's, that's I'm, I'm not saying yeah. no. Well, Joe, uh, selectivity does have its advantages, and obviously we don't want to look at our shoes. We ought to be very proud about the quality of the education at OU Law, but as a postscript to Mike's question, I'm not against, I'm just concerned that we not do anything to diminish uh, the rise, under your watch, quite truthfully, of the University of Oklahoma Law School. Now, th thanks, uh, Regent Keating. Uh, this question of selectivity is a really important one. One of the biggest indicators, as we know, for better or for worse, is the U.S. News rankings. The U.S. News has adapted to this by looking at selectivity based upon average uh, median, actually, LSAT scores. They do it by, by um, quartiles as well as overall median. Um, we believe they're adjusting their criteria to also include how that relates to these test scores as well. Um, so the measure of selectivity and the, in, in the, in the um, quality of a class as measured by standardized test score and as measured by undergraduate GPA will not be undermined uh, uh, by this. Okay. Thank you. I'll just make an editorial comment. Having been the chair of the Board of Visitors for the law school prior to becoming a regent, um, I have never known anybody that would suggest that the LSAT measures intangible uh, factors such as desire and effort. Um, not a great quantifier of how somebody's going to do in law school. It's a, it's a test, but it's not much of a predictor in my personal opinion and as the former chairman of the law school board of visitors. So I'm supportive of this. It's something we want to watch very carefully. And we can change it back if we need to. But it's well, actually a good evolution, I think, from an old practice. Your point's well taken, Gary, and I, and I agree with that. Uh, uh, I just, I'm echoing what Frank said, the law school has, has come a long way under Joe's leadership at the law school, and I just want to make sure the rigor continues at the law school. If I could, I'd, I'd recommend that um, we bring back a report um, to this board that uh, analyzes uh, in detail how one year of this goes and how it's projected. Uh, the admission standards that this board prescribes for undergraduate and graduate programs is a critical function. And so my request would be we take this up, give, them, give the College of Law, especially in this environment, this opportunity. It can always be changed, but that we bring back a report prior to next year um, to provide additional detail and hopefully provide additional comfort. I'll make the motion, Mr. Chairman. Do I have a second? 
Second. Second. Just for information purposes, Joe, when you uh, departed the law school, what was the average LSAT and average grade point of average our GPA was 3.62 and average LSAT was 157. Those are pretty strong, so let's keep those in place. We have a motion. Any other questions or comments? Let's have the vote. Regent Keating? Yes. Regent Colley? Aye. Regent Albert? Yes. Regent Shirley? Aye. Regent Stevenson? Aye. Regent Holloway? Aye. Unanimous, Mr. Chairman. All right, it will be recorded as passing unanimously, which takes us to action item number 15. President Harris, would you lead us through? Mr. Chairman, if I could address agenda items 14, 15, and 16. Um, I'm sorry. Agenda items 15, 16, and 17. Together, each of these are authorizations uh, to move forward with refunding of bonds uh, given the current uh, bond market. This is the maximum ability we can, we can refi at this time. As you can see, uh, it would constitute a material amount uh, of our debt. Um, the Health Science Center campus right now has around $150 million in debt. This would allow for the Health Science Center to refund up to just shy of $70 million. Uh, and you can see the proportionate amounts um, for the Norman campus in agenda item 16 and agenda item 17 uh, with 85 million uh, in one uh, and the other being also uh, 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 a large amount. And so uh, it would allow us to potentially refi about a quarter of our debt outstanding in what is presently a favorable debt environment. I presume by refi you mean refinance? Yes, to refinance. Okay, all right. You have to keep an eye on him, Eric. <laughs> All right, do we have a motion on those three items together? Unless, Neil, we have to, we can move them together. Does anybody object to that part of it? All right, do we have a motion? I move we approve 15, 16, and 17. Do I have a second? Second. Yeah, second. Any final comments, questions, or concerns? Chris? Regent Keating. Aye. Regent Colley. Aye. Regent Albert. Yes. Regent Shirley. Aye. Regent Stevenson. Aye. Regent Holloway. Aye. Yes. We'll have it recorded as passing unanimously. President Harris, please lead us through item 19. Uh, if I could, Excuse I'd like. Me, 18. Yeah. If I could, I'd like to address 18 and 19 together, with your permission. Yes. Uh, these are both personnel actions, both for deans of colleges. The first is for professional and continuing studies. Um, an institution at this university in the last uh, number of years is Dr. Martha Bance. We conducted a national search for this position, um, and uh, she has been interim in that position for a very long time and has done a really good job. Uh, she was the unanimous recommendation of the search committee and I believe will do a great job and is already a great citizen of this university. Uh, the next item, also a personnel matter, is uh, a recommendation on the dean of the Michael F. Price College of Business. Um, the search committee did some excellent work. Dr. Corey Phelps uh, is the person that's recommended. Uh, he comes from McGill University. Uh, the College of Business, his undergraduate program, uh, when I came here 25 years ago, the dream of the then Dean Rick Kozier uh, back in 1994 was to become a top 50 business school in the country. Uh, that was the dream, uh, the big aspiration, the big moonshot. And um, as you all know, this past year, the Michael F. Price College of Business, out of the thousands of business schools, entered that top 50. Uh, it has allowed us to go after a remarkable um, group of dean candidates. Uh, and through a search committee process, uh, uh, Dr. Corey Phelps comes to us, and he's recommended to this board uh, for their approval, for your approval. <clears throat> Do I have a motion on combined 19 and 20? No, excuse me, 18 and 19. So moved. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, second. Uh, any comments, questions, or concerns? Seems that we have COVID and lockjaw sitting in at the same time. <laughs> All right, let's have the vote. Regent Keating. Yes. Regent Collins. Aye. 
Regent Albert? Yes. Regent Shirley? Aye. Regent Stevenson? Aye. Regent Hallway? Aye. Unanimous. I heard a lot on I heard a lot on the golf course on give me putts uh, or don't hear it. We're going to hold item number 20 for tomorrow and item 21 is uh, executive session. I'll entertain a motion for the Board of Regents to go into executive session. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Come on back. All right. Let's have any any comments, questions, or discussion. Do you have to vote? For Do you have to vote by? Yeah, yes. we've got to vote. Yes. Regent Keating. Yes. Regent Colley. Aye. Regent Albert. Yes. Regent Shirley. Aye. Regent Stevenson. Aye. And Regent Hallway. Aye. All right. With. Uh, just a minute of personal privilege will go into executive session. I wanted to echo something President Harris said earlier, and I want to personally and on behalf of the board thank uh, Professor Joshua Nelson, who has been the faculty senate chair um, for the last year. I think his official last official day was Wednesday of this week. I talked to him. Earlier than in the week, he was both uh, sad and happy about that. We look forward to working with Amy. But Joshua was always here. He was always engaged. He was always pleasant. He was always forthcoming. Uh, and he was just a real suitor. Uh, he, he embodied the kind of faculty that we want here at the University of Oklahoma, where there was no question he had his own opinions, but there was also no question he was on the same team. So, Joshua, you're not here, but you will be missed, and we look forward to working with Amy. With that, let's go into an executive session. We will be coming out of executive session at some point today. It's now 2.05. I don't imagine it's going to be much later than 4 o'clock-ish, um, heavy on the ish. And then we will begin again tomorrow morning at 8.45. Uh, we will quickly go into executive session uh, based upon motion and passing uh, and spend uh, probably quite a bit of time in there, but we'll try to keep the press and the audience advised what our status is so that you're just not sitting around all day. And in fact, if you wanted to communicate with Chris's office how to get a hold of you at te with text, we'd be happy to let you know when we're trying to wrap up so that you don't have to sit around. Let's move to executive session. Do I have a second? All those in favor by voice vote? Uh, we're not starting with Frank. He's absent. But Mike? Aye. Um, Regent yes. Albert? Regent Shirley? Aye. 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 <laughs> we're out. Okay. I'll entertain a motion to continue the meeting until 8.45 tomorrow morning. So moved. Do I have a second? Second from Mike. Mike? Yes. Natalie? Aye. 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 There it's Aye. Aye. That's unanimous again. All right, then we are temporar temporarily adjourned. Guys, 